instituted. The, uh, uh, this presentation tonight, and of course, this is uh, this is a uh, in, in in response to last night's uh, election, which I heard there was a big event that went on uh, on last night, and and, and hopefully uh, everybody enjoyed it. And I thought I'd start by, and I, of course, I couldn't. I couldn't prepare anything because I I didn't know who was who was going to win. I actually threw out a prediction to staff because you know like everybody else I, I said I thought it's going to be a tie. I thought Trump would hold Florida and uh, North Carolina and Ohio, uh, and that he might win uh, Nevada and uh, New Hampshire, leading to a tie to go to the House of Representatives. I never thought he'd win, break the the blue wall. So it it, it just goes to show you you can't just like you can't trust economic or market prognosticators who say it's going to do one thing, and the next minute, of course, uh, they uh, they're completely wrong and, and fooled. And so, one thing that I, I put out uh, for the newsletter and part of our economic review is I put these slide presentations out to you. And in the slide presentations, it's meant to accompany the the, the newsletter. And uh, in the in the slide presentation, probably one of the ones that I liked the best was was this one, which really, and I named it that you, you just can't you can't time the market. There's really no way for anyone to to time the market. And what happened, of course, during the the Brexit uh, was a massive sell-off when it looked like the evening before the British were going to uh, approve it. Uh, and, and 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 go and stay in the union, and all of a sudden they were out, and the market sold off huge. But in a very short period of time, the market rallied back. Now this rally was almost insane uh, because at one point CNBC and MSCNBC were touting you know the 800 point decline in the markets. And if you look at just a day, uh, this was a we had a massive sell off and a massive recovery to the point where the market sold. Uh, it re recovered up today. Um, just a remarkable recovery, which again, you know, had Clinton won today, and I know we have some liberal left-leaning clients on board the call tonight, and I know we have some right-leaning, and I think Obama gave the best advice, and I said the same thing to to, to our clients and staff that, listen, the sun's going to come up this morning. It's okay. Uh, I, uh, I expected that um, we would have a, a, a gridlocked or, or a mildly uh, uh, leaning, right-leaning, uh, possibly or left-leaning Congress, uh, but that things wouldn't change too much. I was very happy to see my friend Todd Young, uh, who's a congressman from Indiana, win the Senate race last night. We were in the Marine Corps together and uh, at the Naval Academy together, so it was nice to see Todd Todd win. We were shooting a couple of texts back and forth, and of course he was going against Evan Bayh and beat him pretty soundly. And Evan's a big uh, force in in Democratic um, circles. So it was nice to, to see a guy. It gives you, it heartens you that good people uh, still go into government service because I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to do it. It's, it's very uh, difficult work. So um, you just, it, it, as you can see here too, I'll kind of use my my pointer. What happened uh, during the Brexit recovery? And I'll, I'll, let me go back to the to the slide first. This happened in June, June specifically from June 24th to, to June 27th. You can see that the market sold off rather dramatically here. I use a pretty pink color. Maybe I should change that color to like a blue here. You have a massive sell-off and then a quick recovery, really, in very few days. And you'll remember at that time I wrote the it was the most read blog uh, that has ever been read. Actually, it was my Brexit Schmegzit blog, and and the uh, the Brexit Schmegzit blog. Uh, I think 40% of People, 48% actually clicked on it and, and read it. So it was a highly read blog because people were really concerned. They were concerned about the sell-off, and it's probably why we have a lot of uh, people on the call tonight, right? They're very concerned about what could happen and uh, what's going on with the uh, with the market, what's going on with the economy. And I could have rewritten this same article for this election. I could have called it Trexit Schmexit, I guess, right? For a Trump for a Trump uh, victory uh, or a Trump exit. Um, and I could have said, replaced everything with Brexit for the Trump victory and effectively be the same thing. In fact, if you look at a lot of blogs, you'll see there's a common theme that 
you know, we're we're investing for the long term. I and 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 if I woke up this morning, regardless of who was president, and, and you know, it was nice at three thirty as I was listening to the uh, to the victory speech, which was actually quite gracious, and 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 listening to it. And if I woke up this morning and there was somebody else, though, it, it wouldn't matter. We'd still be eating uh, hamburgers. Uh, you know, in in America, and they'd still be eating hamburgers in China. We'd still be eating Nestle chocolate in Latin America, and they'd still be drinking Pepsi uh, in India, right? So uh, here in the in the states, there's there's definitely some impact. We put a lot of my daughter's friends here in some and outside New York are extremely left leaning parents, and they're all saying this is the end times, and it it's it, it, it's really okay. You know, we've we've been through this before. We've been through uh, all kinds of uh, uh, left and right leaning organizations. So, from that perspective, uh, I would say, you know, whoever was president today, I'd be, I would be starting this presentation by saying the same exact thing. Now, the particulars of what industries may do better is different, and I'll kind of get into into that a little bit. And right now, I'm just going to open this up. I'm going to unmute everybody here uh, to see if you had uh, any questions. And you can also use the uh, use the chat. So you, everybody's unmuted right now. And uh, does anybody have any any questions uh, about anything as I'm going along? No questions. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Affirmative. Okay. Good. Um, yep. All right. I'll keep going then with slides um, and kind of kind of work my way through. Just to give you a quick recap on performance this year too. We're having a great year. I don't, you know, our strategy, it, there's going to be years that you look at and you can always see our performance. All of you, just like me, I own the same 75 stocks that, that you own. We own. I own the same bonds that you do. By the way, all of our associates in our profit sharing plan 401k also own the same stocks and bonds that you do side by side our clients, which I think is very important for you to, for you to know for those who, who don't know that. But you can always go to the global income and see, and your portfolio is going to do pretty close to this because it, what it's doing is it's aggregating my performance with yours and all of us together. And the nice thing this year is, you know, right now we're killing it. We're having a great year. We're up 13% as of the end of the year. Of course, the quarter has come back down a little bit. So right now we're up like 10.5% or so uh, after fees, a little bit more before. Um, and this number is going to change. Right now, it's nice that we're in the top 1% in the world. And you can see that's that's always great, right? It's always, especially up here in the New York area, it's nice to be in the top 1% and say, oh, look at me and pound our chest and, and do well. But there's going to be times when I'm in the bottom 10 or 15%. Our, our strategy is never to, to take huge risks with your, with your money because I know it's your life savings. Um, I'm just trying to get you steady and prudent returns and regardless of the ups and downs in the market, those clients who have been with us for decades now, and we actually have our 20th anniversary coming up next year, um, the important thing for you to always remember is we've been through this before. We've been through horrific downturns and ups and downs in the market. But the income, these green triangles, have always been there for our clients in good times and in bad. And it's nice that we've doubled your money over this period of time and uh, that's lovely. And of course, even our clients who are taking income out have more. If you started with a million, you have more than that million today, and you've taken out four percent a year. You know, you're you're doing well. And none of our clients had to go uh, back to work during the financial recession, and they didn't have to go back to work because their income didn't change. Right? Their income stayed steady. If you invested a million dollars, you were doing great, and you loved me right here, and you're up a million dollars, a million and a half, and then all of a sudden, boom. We're back down to even a million, right? Your initial investment. You're saying, oh, geez, Jim, we lost all this money. I said, well, unless you force me to sell shares of McDonald's, unless you force me to sell your, sell your bonds, you haven't lost anything. It's just paper loss because McDonald's is still paying you that at that time. You know, you can see the income, the dividend yield actually goes up when the market value goes down. On a real cash, the next slide shows like the real, uh, the real cash of how you're doing. Uh, you can see that the income, again, didn't, didn't change even there during the financial crisis here. It was steady. The only time it goes down is sometimes I'll buy more, I'll buy more uh, stocks sometimes for the portfolio if I think stocks are cheap, and I'll kind of talk about that later, uh, U.S. stocks versus international. 
and uh, or if I buy a little bit more fixed income. Right now we're at about 53, 54% stock for our portfolios. Uh, and what's nice is that again our clients have not only doubled their money, more than doubled their money, but they've they've uh, increased their income potential dramatically over the past. And and you see that when you see the real money, 85% of your total return on average over the last decade plus has come from dividends and interest. And this is what my friends up here in New York don't really understand. They they're looking more at total return and Jim Cramer who is just on TV is yelling about some stock uh, you, you know that that's that's the constant stuff that that you see going on in the uh, in the market where people are always concerned about you know am I going to get in and out of this stock we're, we're not doing that we're buying companies for the long haul like Warren Buffett and we're collecting dividends as you know which is nice we're we're collecting these dividends for our clients uh, as we go um, to give you a, um, I, I forgot to mute everybody here. Let me mute you back on here, and just shoot me a, a quick chat if I mute myself. I don't know why I used to mute myself in the process. So, how we're doing year to date, and just the overall market, how the market's doing uh, year to date, is you could see that the S&P 500 shot up today, right? It was a big, it was a big day. That's this this blue line here, which I'll make a little bit thicker. You can see the blue line is up on the year. Now our stocks are up about eight. Uh, actually, after today, much more. So through yesterday, we were up 8% with the S&P here. So our stocks are really outperforming this year, doing exceptionally well. That's the U.S. portion of your stocks. That's Caterpillar and all those kind of names that you see in your portfolio. Um, again, we could be down this year, but the dividends would be there for you. The international market, which I think is quite undervalued right now, uh, is still down for the year. It's not performing uh, all that well. And I think that uh, eventually what we'll see is a crisscrossing. If you look at the international market, just to kind of, uh, I'll, I'll briefly end it here uh, quick, just to give the recap here though too. As you can see, bonds are doing okay. They're holding in there and high yield bonds are doing better. By the way, our bonds are up over 20% this year. Um, they've really just killed it. Our bonds have done exceptionally well uh, and been a big portion of, you know, after a year and a half of a lot of paper losses and some defaults that we had from energy companies, our bonds have recovered uh, exceptionally well this year. We were saying the same thing to clients. Don't you know the clients don't don't force us to sell these bonds. Hold in there. Sometimes our clients get a little confused with our mutual fund. Let me move this over here. When you go to our website, none of you are in our mutual fund. We don't. We only sell the mutual fund. That's this fund right here. We only sell that to other advisors around the country. And the mutual fund's doing great. I mean, our mutual fund. If you look at our performance here. We are in the top 9% in the non-traditional bond category. We're up 9.5%. We're not up 20% like our bonds. But here I have to be a little bit more conservative with the mutual funds. And again, we're selling this mutual fund to all advisors all over the country uh, because we're a money manager firm. The nice thing is when you retain us, you get the great financial planning and wealth management services from Tara and from Chris and from our team. Uh, but we also eliminate the middleman. Most advisory firms, wealth manager firms, they're charging their clients a 1% fee, and then they're putting them in our mutual fund, which is charging another 1%, so the fees are double to their clients. Uh, our clients own the individual bonds, so it's fully transparent, and I'll kind of show you what that looks like, too, and show you what the bond portfolio. Uh, so, and it's just much better because you control the interest rate risk, whereas I can't control the interest rate risk. If I get a call tomorrow from an advisor in St. Louis um, that says, hey, sell me, so my client is leaving, you gotta sell out of all of our clients' positions, it's $5 million. Everybody gets hurt in the mutual fund as I'm selling out those, those assets, um, which, is, which, is, which is problematic. And how that works as a, as a team, too, so that most of you know, uh, you know we have a team approach, and uh, Chris and, and Joy are in the, uh, in the Raleigh office, uh, Chris is the CFA, and uh, Michigan grad tennis player uh, at a, at Michigan, got his MBA in Indiana. Uh, Tara, uh, many of you work with, she's your lead advisor, is a CPA, uh, West Virginia tech grad, uh, has been with us a lot of years now, six, seven years. And uh, she, of course, is in the uh, Newburn office with, with Rita and Becky. And uh, Joy and Becky are doing a lot of the actual rebalancing and trading on your accounts. Uh, all the mistakes are mine, all the approval are mine. Zach is up here in the New Jersey. Uh, office mostly working from Brooklyn actually and um, 
uh, with Annie. Fortunately, Annie followed me up here, who's uh, you know my wife. Annie's not an advisor any longer. She does a lot of our compliance and back office and operations. So the team, you know, we're all we're all obviously working for the wealth management side for you, and then on the portfolio management side is the analysis where I'm saying, okay, we want to sell this stock and, and buy that stock, and uh, and and Zach is overseeing uh, Joy and Becky, uh, in particular on the fixed income side and fitting things in. Uh, so I'll kind of get into the bond portion later too, but just wanted to kind of introduce a team. For many of you haven't met, and so we have other officers haven't met uh, some of our other uh, our other team with, with Altrius. Uh, let's see what else here I want to talk about. So going back to you know where we are this year and and how we're doing. Again, our our stocks are doing very well across the board. We're we're outperforming. You know our stocks are doing exceptionally well this year, up eight and a half. The international market's down, but our stocks are up. Our bonds are really just, you know, killing it this year, up 20.9%. Uh, and uh, overall, our portfolio, I think we're up 13% at the end of the quarter. And again, the market's kind of come back here a little bit. Uh, this doesn't reflect today's bounce, by the way. All this is going to be up another percent or so after today's bounce. Um, so just wanted to talk briefly. I'll unmute everybody here and see if you had any uh, questions again as we go. Any other questions about performance or the mutual fund or strategy? Uh, Hi, Jim. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Jim, explain why are bonds up 20%? That that uh, that sounds great. Uh, explain uh, how they got that 20%. Right. Sure. So it's two two ways. You'll kind of see the breakdown here. Is a part of that is the interest payments, right? So the bonds are paying a coupon, so of of about eight or so seven percent or so. So seven percent is coming from that. The other one, the other portion of that gain is coming from when prices are distressed. And let me show you with an actual actual bond because I think that'll that'll kind of help. So here's our here's our bond portfolio, and let me take a company that you. You may know like uh, Ruby Tuesday, so or Hertz from yesterday. We we're actually buying we were we were buying Avis budget car yesterday, so we bought like uh, I don't know how much we bought yesterday, three or four hundred thousand dollars. And remember, when we buy three or four hundred thousand dollars of Avis rental car, we're buying it for because Hertz was down. Most rational people would be panicking, going, "Oh my God, Hertz is down 50 percent! Run, run, run! Sell, sell, sell!" The computer algorithms are all selling. Well, a cold-hearted economist like me says, well, where's their opportunity? And we own Hertz. We think, okay, Hertz isn't going bankrupt. And wow, Avis is down in sympathy too. Let's let's buy Avis today. Um, so let me bring up Ruby Tuesday as a, a good example. So here's here's Ruby Tuesday. When when we buy Ruby Tuesday for you and me, which I own in my personal portfolio too, you can see the coupon 7.625. So that means as long as Ruby Tuesday doesn't go bankrupt. Now we own 400, and this is actually in the composite. So we own 439,000. We don't own more than half a percent in any one bond because I'm going to be wrong. I'm going to make mistakes, so especially when we're getting a potential seven, eight percent rate of return. I'm trying to get you five or six, knowing that we're going to have defaults along the way. If the price goes down, so right now you can see I paid hundred dollars for it, right? So that means if you invested a hundred thousand dollars into the bond, uh, into into Ruby Tuesday, and it was the price today, we woke up would be ninety five fifty. That means your hundred thousand dollars went down to ninety five thousand and five hundred dollars. And you might be nervous. You say, "Oh no, Jim, you're a moron. You know, you bought this thing for me, and it's down five percent." And my answer, of course, is, "I don't, I don't, I don't care. You know, that's I don't care that it's down. In fact, we probably would be buying more of it and adding to our position. The only thing I care about is, is Ruby Tuesday going to go bankrupt between right now and when it matures in May of 2020?" If it doesn't, you are going to make a 9.1% rate of return because you're going to make money two ways. One, on your $100,000, they're going to pay you $7,625 for the year. They're going to pay it twice a year. So they're going to pay you know that in half usually in, say, January or in August or January and July. But then also they're going to give you your $100 back. Ruby Tuesday is going to say, 
Thank you, Altrius, for lending us money. We appreciate you letting our business grow. We're a good business. And think of most of the businesses that we're investing in. As um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna mute everybody again too because I'm getting a little echo on my ear here. But think of the businesses that we're investing in, kind of like you're a like a a newly minted doctor at a med school. You know, the new doctor has a good job. He's making four hundred thousand dollars a year, and he goes out and buys a house. And the doctor buys the house, and the house costs a million dollars, let's say. And it's a beautiful home on the water, and he's happy living in that home. See, here's the happy doctor. And the bank lends him the money to buy that house at a million dollars. And let's say it's a five year adjustable rate mortgage. Well, the doctor also has $300,000 of debt from medical school. Right? So he's got that debt. But he's doing very well because he's making $400,000 a year. So he could pay off the interest that he has to pay for his home. And for his uh, medical school debt. So he's able to make those interest payments and he keeps paying the bank back and no problem. Now let's say the bank five years from now says, hey doctor, uh, we need the million dollars back that we gave you. Well, the doctor would say, well, what do you mean? I'm paying the interest back and, and I'm doing fine. I have the interest. I have plenty of income. I can pay you. Well, that's like most companies in America. Most companies, you don't get paid for the balance sheet. If if Ruby Tuesday, um, if Ruby Tuesday had you know 300 million dollars lying around and didn't need it to be lent, like Apple Computer, you're going to get a rate of return right now. The U.S. Treasury that let's say 1.8 percent is what you're going to get. Of course, if you get a CD or a short-term yield right now, you're going to get a very small rate of return. Well, Apple Apple Computer you may get a 2.1% or 2.2% rate of return if we lend money to Apple. We're just not getting paid for the risk to lend that money to Apple. Uh, but we are getting paid for the risk to lend the money to Ruby Tuesday. And we're making money in two ways. Like I mentioned, we're making money, one, because maybe we bought it at a discount, right? So maybe we bought it at 95 and we're going to make that 5%. And two, we're getting a very nice coupon over the next for four years or so. And that's how we make money uh, when we buy bonds for you. And when people panic and they get nervous, the price of the bonds go down. So people will say, oh, geez, Jim, your portfolio is down 10%. I'm really scared. Or Ruby Tuesday is down 10%. And I always say, you know, don't, don't worry about the ups and downs. Uh, most of these companies are not going to go bankrupt. And then further, what we do is I stress test the portfolio. So we say, okay, what if I'm completely wrong? If you look at the last couple of decades, especially since we're investing in high yield bonds right now, you'll see there's a slide here, which shows that over the last two decades, the worst time period actually didn't occur during the financial crisis in here. The worst time period actually occurred when I was coming out of uh, the Naval Academy and going off to flight school. I had a job, right, because I had a government job. Um, but a lot of my friends, if you remember the savings and loan crisis, they went back to college to, you know, back in 91 when I was graduating. This period of time, we had very high default rates. So what we do is we say, okay, what if we had default rates that were that high again? What if 30% of the companies that we're investing in so if we're investing in 90 bonds, let's say if 30 of them went bankrupt, right? To go back to the to go back to the the portfolio, if you look at our uh, if you look at our portfolio, that means that all of these bonds we own, Sears and Sonic Automotive, which we just bought, which is like a Penske Automotive, and Service Master and Sprint, uh, Telecom Italia, uh, Targa, Toys R Us, uh, Ruby Tuesday. Rent-A-Center, let's say all of these Rite Aid drugstore, Revlon, uh, all of these companies go bankrupt, 30, 30 of them. If that happens, what happens? Well, the answer is what happens is we're still going to get um, not a bad rate of return. We're going to get about a 1.8% rate of return, which, oh, by the way, as I mentioned earlier, if you look at, uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, U.S. Treasury like I do on a, on a daily basis and you look at the yield curve, if you lend money to the U.S. government right now 
you're only getting about a 1.8% rate of return. It's actually a little higher right now because the market is starting to uh, accept that, hey, maybe we, the Federal Reserve may be raising interest rates. But you're not going to want to lend money out to 10 years. If you lend money out to the U.S. government over a two-year period, you're only going to get a 0.9%. And this is what I'm saying to advisors around the country right now. Advisors are saying, well, we have to put some money in safe bonds. And I'm telling them, Mr. Advisor, because believe me, advisors are dopier than average investors that you see on television. You know, you would think that a financial advisor is astute. Wrong. Most of the financial advisors, many of the financial advisors I'm talking to, uh, they panic well before their clients. They panic well before the average investor, and they do exceptionally dumb things with their clients' portfolios. So what I'm constantly telling them is, listen, Mr. Mr. Um, client, or Mr. Advisor, you're charging your client 1% a year, and what is the rate of return that you're putting your client in? Well, two. So I'll ask them, what is two minus one? And they, due to their exceptional math, will say, well, that's 1%. And I'll say, great. Can your client, Mr. Advisor of Chicago, Mr. Advisor of Florida, retire on 1% a year? That means if you give me a million dollars, if Tara or Chris told you that you could only spend $10,000 a year, I ask the advisor, can you retire on that? And the answer, of course, is no. Uh, so I ask them, then why, for the love of God, aren't you investing in the types of bonds that we invest in for our clients and that I'm investing in? Oh, well, we don't know enough about that. And I said, well, that's fine. So the, We'll invest for your clients. You can hire us to do exactly what we do for our clients, individual bonds for them, uh, like we're going to do for a Mississippi firm next year. There's a, a Jackson, Mississippi firm with about $200 million that we'll be managing for their clients. Or you could buy our mutual fund if you want. It's much better if you buy the individual bonds because the problem, as I mentioned, when you go back to the, uh, the individual bonds, the nice thing is, is we know with all these bonds that we own that we're going to get a 7.8% 9% return if we have no defaults. Now, again, if we have a certain amount of defaults, I'll even stress test the portfolio beyond that. I said we use 30% as a recession type of scenario. So I'll say, what if I'm really wrong? What if out of our 90 bonds, what if 40% went bankrupt? And let's say we only get 25 cents on the dollar recovery, meaning after we sell the equipment of those companies, we only get 25 cents on the dollar back. Sometimes we get more, like with Harris, maybe we get 60 cents, 65 cents on the dollar through a bankruptcy. Sometimes we get less. Sometimes we get nothing, like in a Quicksilver type situation when, uh, when they just don't have the assets. Or worse, a bankruptcy judge decides to save a certain amount of jobs and we're not getting anything, like what's happening with us with Blockbuster. Um, under that scenario, we're still not losing very much money, right? And so the opportunity cost of investing safely and too safely is not a good scenario. So as an economist, I look at things and say, okay, where are the opportunities? What is the best case scenario? What's the worst case scenario? Because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow to a particular company. So what I do is use scenario analysis and we say, okay, what if the guys who get on CNBC who are selling doom and gloom every day, what if they're right, right? Here's the bad news. Stocks lose about 25% over the next five years. Now, none of you are going to be happy if I lose you 25% over the next five years, but it is possible that that could happen from both international stocks and U.S. stocks. Now, my answer to you will be the same. Don't worry about it because remember, what? The income is there for you, right? To get back to the most important slide, the only slide that Tara and Chris and I are continually talking about for our clients is the income is there for you. Even if we go down 25%, even if we have another financial crisis, the income is there for you to just keep collecting your dividend. Just don't force us to sell McDonald's and you're going to be fine. You're not investing in hope like my friends around here in New York who are always investing in the next fancy uh, company or next fancy stock and hoping it goes up and that they can sell at the right time. We're investing long term. I think McDonald's is a $200 stock. I'm looking at McDonald's over the next decade. It could go down 20% tomorrow. I, I don't know. But I do know with some certitude are confident that McDonald's is going to continue to grow their dividend as they have in the past for you. And th that has always been our boring, steady strategy of how, how we invest. Now, 
what does that mean in the in the bull case scenario? What if what if the bulls are right? Then stocks are off to the races, right? And this could happen. We and I'll show you where we are right now in this recovery. It's possible that stocks do exceptionally well over the next five years. The truth is probably in the middle here. And why U.S. stocks do not look near as attractive to us right now is they've had a big run up. International stocks look very attractive. That's not to say that. U.S. stocks, I, I would have thought that international stocks, let me take out high yield and let me take out the bond market and let's look at the last five years. This is the U.S. stock market versus the international market. It's not even close, right? The U.S. stock market has trounced the international market. But what happens when you look over longer periods of time, if you go back over uh, much longer periods of time, you'll see that, go back here to max, You'll see that there are periods of time, uh, that's the, uh, unfortunately that particular ETF doesn't, but you'll, you'll see that there are plenty of times when international, they kind of diverge. And you'll see there are periods, five-year periods where international well outperforms and U.S. underperforms. And so right now, we have 20% of your portfolio in international stocks. These are companies like, uh, you know, the energy companies you would know like British Petroleum and Total, a French oil company, E and I, uh, or Diageo and Nestle Chocolate, uh, and of course we own U.S. stocks like Exxon and Chevron and uh, Kellogg's and Pepsi, uh, and we have right now about 35 percent, 34 percent or so in, in U.S. stocks. Uh, so it's about a 50/50 portfolio, a little more than 50/50 stock to bond. The rest of your portfolio is in, in, in bonds, as as mine is also. So that's that's how we look at the world. Say, well, we're where are the opportunities globally? Now, why aren't we investing in so-called safe, safe bonds? Because you can see from safe bonds, we get a terrible investment in a recession. We get a terrible return in our base case scenario. And we get a terrible return in our bull scenario. It's just not pretty under other, any scenario. So we have to take risks to get you to retirement and to get you that prudent rate of return. Um, so I just wanted to point out how we start and why we talk about top down and then it becomes a bottom up process where we're looking at the individual bonds and we're saying, okay, now, now it becomes a, a situation of what do we look at as far as, uh, you know, Ruby Tuesday to go back to, to Ruby Tuesday, find it here. Um, you know, do we think Ruby Tuesday is a, uh, is, is a good company for us to, to invest in? And again, we'll diversify those to make sure it's not too much of any uh, one portfolio. Let me unmute everybody here again so that uh, I'll uh, open up your questions. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions they want to ask while I'm going through the bond portion? No. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Um, so now, what's your portfolio look like in in total? Well. I'll show you here what it looks like right right now as a snapshot in time as of yesterday's close of business. So again, we have about 20% of our portfolio is in international stocks and 33.8% is in U.S. stocks. And uh, we have only about 35 U.S. stocks. That's Merck and, and KKR and others. And, and you'll have – now. I'll talk a little bit about specifics. Who's going to win and who's going to lose? Well, the market quickly decided today who some of the winners and losers were with the Donald Trump uh, victory. So, and I'll, I'll show you this thing. I'll pull up um, what happened to, to some sectors uh, today. And it would have been reversed had, had Hillary, Hillary won, which is why we want to be diversified, right? We don't want too much in any one particular type of uh, company. So if you look at today, you'll see that you know Caterpillar and um, Merck and Pfizer were way up there too today. So you can see Caterpillar was up 7.7 .7 because Donald Trump was talking about how we're going to do a lot of infrastructure, right? We could build a wall. So if we're going to build a wall, it's going to take a lot of cement, it's going to take a lot of digging, and it's going to take a, a lot of Caterpillar machinery to make that happen. Now we own Caterpillar not for U.S but more for, for, for China growth, right? So we're, uh, and again, from a healthcare standpoint, 
Well, Obamacare may be gone, so that allows drug companies to compete more globally and not have to worry about price controls and things of that nature. So Pfizer did very well today, Merck did very well. <clears throat> Some of the same story for international stocks. Many people think GlaxoSmithKline is, an international, is a U.S. company, of course, it's a, a British company. AstraZeneca, Novartis, some of our international companies, uh, Sanofi Aventis is a, is a drug company. Uh, you know a lot of the drugs they make. Have done very have done very well uh, today for that for that reason, and that's what you saw with the Trump victory. Is that going to continue? I don't know. The important thing is is to make sure that your portfolio is diversified amongst all sectors. I'll lean one way or another that I think there's opportunity to show you that some areas because we like dividends so much. I'm going to mute everybody again too because I'm getting my feedback here. Um, from a feedback standpoint, or from a uh, from an income standpoint, and I'll show you the portfolio, what it looks like uh, per sector. You'll notice that, you know, again, in looking at our portfolio of U.S. stocks, you'll see the energy companies we own, like Chevron, Conoco, Phillips, Marathon. The nice thing is, is that you're getting that 3.1% dividend yield from those stocks. Same thing with international paper, and obviously. Uh, materials company, uh, industrial companies that we own, uh, like Caterpillar, you know, it has a nice 3.6 dividend yield. Even if it was down 7% today, uh, let's say Hillary won, I'd say don't worry about it. China's going to still buy, you know, big rigs that they need to dig and, and build their infrastructure. We're buying it for the long term. It's still going to pay you that 3.6% dividend yield. It's the same about all the companies we own. Ford and GM, I've been early on, right? Ford and GM have been selling off on us still. I think eventually, even though Generation Y is not buying as many cars, there's a tremendous opportunity. The dividend yield is very large. We also own Honda and Toyota. So as you get down here to the bottom of all of our U.S. stocks, Pepsi, Kellogg's, Merck, New York Bank Corp, J.P. Morgan, Aflac, Intel, Apple, uh, and Pitney Bowes, AT&T, Verizon. When you get down here to the bottom, uh, you'll notice again that in starts our international stocks, and we ha we own all of these international energy companies like Sasol and Stadol. Uh, you know, these are uh, South African, uh, uh, Norwegian uh, companies. Uh, Total, Transocean, which is really a Transocean's an American company, right? They're a Texas company, but America was taxing them too much, so what did they say? Hey, most of our revenue is overseas. We're no longer a U.S. company. We're now a Swiss company. You know, we're now an overseas company. Uh, one good thing that Bush has promised, and I've talked to my friend Todd, who's now a senator in Indiana about, is, hey, how about these billions and billions of dollars that are sitting offshore? Let's let Apple bring it back to America. Well, if Apple brings it back to America, what can they do with it? They can pay you a higher dividend. They can pay you higher dividends. Microsoft can pay you higher dividends. There's billions offshore. America, in its unique wisdom, taxes companies twice, right? So they're taxed overseas. They're going to keep that money overseas, and they're going to invest it overseas. Every other country around the world that only taxes it once in the country where it's produced, when it's made, it comes back to America. America taxes it again. And oh, by the way, when the company pays you a dividend, they tax you a third time on that money. And oh, by the way, when you die with too much of that stock, they'll tax you with the state tax on that money. It, it, it's really horrific, right? So both Trump and Clinton have talked about fixing that. Republicans want to get that fixed. This could be a massive fix. This could be a huge boon to dividends and for our portfolios, for them to bring back more cash into the United States. And oh, by the way, they can employ more people. It's just common sense, right? Um, and both Democrats and Republicans have been on the side of that tax reform. Why it hasn't got done, I have no idea. Um, other than, you know, continue gridlock. And again, if you look at our international companies, we own great companies like Honda and Toyota. Uh, international companies right now have higher dividend yield, and I think these companies are cheaper. Consumer staple companies, Anheuser-Busch, yes, the great Anheuser-Busch is now a Dutch company. Uh, I guess we borrowed uh, Adolf uh, or uh, uh, Augustus, and, and we, 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 we borrowed him from Europe for a while, and it, it, the, the company has now been returned uh, to Europe. Diageo, of course, is a, an Irish company. It makes uh, Tangeray, Johnny Walker Scott, Smirnoff Vodka, Guinness Beer, Bailey's Irish Cream, a lot of great. Uh, so uh, when you partake of those uh, adult beverages, uh, you can at least uh, maybe we drink more when things are uh, things are down, and at least what I do, of course, is eat more chocolate. So 
uh, and, and Nestle chocolate. So these are the companies we own, the international companies that we own uh, for you and, and that I own in my uh, personal portfolio also. Now, why do I think international stocks are, are cheaper right now? I'll go ahead and unmute everybody too, just to make sure you don't have any questions right now. Um, any any questions? Well, hey Jim. Yes, sir. Jim, quick yeah, question: As you get in, hi Jim. As you get into the internet sector, um, traveling overseas, it seems like some of the European uh, economies are are under a little bit of a stress. Uh, how do you factor those kind of economics into your equation? Right. So uh, we're doing it two ways. The one way is looking at things from a purely economic standpoint and valuing the companies, valuing the economies, and saying, okay, in a worst-case scenario, they look as bad as U.S. stock. In a Midland case, they look a lot more attractive. They're a lot cheaper, even though things are distressed. You know, and even in the best case, we look, we think that international stocks really outperform U.S. stocks. Now, again, in the short term, I could be wrong, right? U.S. stocks could continue like they are this year to outpace international stocks, and we have more in U.S. stocks actually at 33 percent than we do in U.S. stocks because uh, they tend to be more volatile. But I want to show you one chart that kind of shows exactly that, that European stocks right now, in particular, which is certainly a more stressed economy, remember that Europe's not really selling, like, European companies are selling to the globe. It's kind of like American companies aren't really American companies. If you look at, uh, for example, McDonald's, McDonald's isn't really an American company uh, because 66%, as you can see here, of its revenues are generated from overseas. So. If, like Transocean, McDonald's just said, you know what, America, forget you, you're taxing us too much, we're now going to be a, an Irish company because the Irish are giving us a better tax advantage. They're going to they're going to move they're going to move offshore, and I, I'm going to value them independently of how the company is is doing. They're not really selling in just Europe; they're selling in China and India, and they're growing in Africa and all around the world. And and where they're headquartered makes no relevance whatsoever. So you can have a great company like Nestle, and Switzerland could be doing horribly, but they're not selling a lot of their chocolate in, in just Switzerland. So when you look at right now, if you look at European companies, and you look at this divergence between U.S. stocks, which I was saying earlier how sometimes you see how international stocks will outperform, and sometimes they'll look a little bit more expensive, and then they'll go down, and they diverge. Well, you see this huge gap that we have right now between international stocks are valued at 15 times earnings and U.S. stocks are valued at 22 times earnings. So international stocks, even a slower growth economy, look really cheap. And oh, by the way, international stocks that we're owning own, are paying you about a 4.5% dividend, whereas the U.S. stocks we own are at 3.5%. Now, the, the normal question I get asked right now is, well, Jim, if the U.S. stocks are overvalued, why are you investing in? Well, our value for our stocks is not 22 times earnings. The companies we own are selling at 15 times earnings. So we're much cheaper than the overall market because we're value investors. We're not going to try to, we're going to try to buy the stuff. When I was buying Caterpillar, Jim Cramer was going crazy about Caterpillar. Don't invest in it. I hate it. Blah, blah, blah. We're usually, but same thing with McDonald's. Everybody's saying, oh, McDonald's is over. Everybody's buying Chipotle. This is the worst company in the world. And I would say, please go read my blog the blog I wrote about McDonald's versus Shake Shack. Every newly minted MBA I always, I had an interview today, they always want to talk about the sexy stocks, the Shake Shack. Now, I love the Shake Shack burgers, right? They're great. Well, here's McDonald's versus Shake Shack. McDonald's, everybody hated. McDonald's is just toiling around down here. Shake Shack's going through the roof. It's up 30%. Well, what happened to Shake Shack? And you could have put the same thing in here for Chipotle, or any of these other companies where they're selling at 40, 50, 60 times earnings, never going to pay that much for a company. But McDonald's is much cheaper, and he all of a sudden, boom, McDonald's bounced. Now, McDonald's has come down a little bit since I wrote this blog, too. But I think over longer periods of time, McDonald's has given you a 3.5% dividend yield. Shake Shack has given you zero. And you're paying three to four times as much for Shake Shack. So we're always going to buy the boring stock that's selling cheap. That's the Warren Buffett style of investing. 
that's always the way we're going to invest. With the caveat of Warren Buffett doesn't pay you dividends. We like to pay dividends. We like companies to pay our clients cash. We buy Berkshire Hathaway. We have to hope Berkshire Hathaway goes up, and then you have to sell Berkshire Hathaway stock to get you the income you need. You never have to sell a share of McDonald's. Even if McDonald's was down in this chart, even if McDonald's was down here with Shake Shack, they're still paying you the same amount of income. If I put a million dollars of our clients' assets all in McDonald's, not that I would put all of your money in one stock, but let's say I put it all in McDonald's. Well, we know that McDonald's is going to pay you $35,000 a year, let's say, because they're paying, you know, they're, they're, that's the dividend uh, rate that they're paying. In fact, that McDonald's has paid continually rising dividends over time. <clears throat> now, that being said, let's say McDonald's goes down 20% and your money is down to 800000 You'd be concerned. You'd be calling us saying, oh, my God, my portfolio is down $800,000. But we would say, don't panic. You're still getting $35,000 a year. Don't, let, don't force us to sell your shares of McDonald's. In fact, what happens is the dividend stocks is you're collecting $35,000 on $800,000 of value now. Now you've got a dividend yield of 4.3%. And what happens is, is people start saying, you know what, McDonald's looks pretty attractive at 4.3%. Let's buy. And that puts almost a floor in a lot of value stocks, dividend-paying stocks. <clears throat> so um, to get back, this is a very long-winded answer, obviously, to your question uh, about why, why Europe looks looks cheap uh, to me right now and, and you can see why why Europe just from a valuation standpoint looks cheap uh, now again it could get cheaper you know we could see it Europe go down we could see the US market keep going but eventually what happens as you can see is these things tend to diverge and, and uh, as you've seen here from this is a chart from 1990 or 1985 through 2015 kind of see international stocks outperforming, 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 you know, and then underperforming and, and so on. So you usually have this divert this is a huge divergence here. So we'll we'll likely see this kind of close and come back uh, together. And I'm not sure did I answer did I answer your question on the European? Yes, you certainly did. Yep, yep, thanks Jim. Sure. Same thing same thing here too is European earnings, because you look at the European earnings over the longer period. This again, I like to look at things very long term. Wall Street's all about what's happening today, what's happening this quarter. You know, I've been doing this 20 years now. I grew up in this business, 1973. My dad actually got in the business in 1973, right before the energy crisis, which was horrible. The stock market went down 50%. It was rough. But I like to look at very long-term charts and see where we are. And you can see European earnings right now are well below their mean earnings per share. So this is just another metric uh, that I can use to say that, yeah, Looking back at the last decades, many decades, and, and and what happens to to international stocks where they're under, they're under, they're under. And this is a very long period of time, by the way, from 1982 to you know 2000. Uh, they eventually start to come up. It went well above the mark, came well below the mark, went well above the mark again in 2010, came well below the mark, and now I think they should you know be back up here and give us a nice rate of return. Now, even though we have a dividend strategy, we want to be very careful in certain sectors. Everybody's reaching for yield right now, and utility stocks got devastated today. So even though we have a dividend strategy, we don't own any U.S. utilities because utility stocks are way, way too expensive right now. So you might think, like, oh, well, let me invest in something that is safe. Let me invest in a company like many of you would know, Duke Energy. And uh, up here in New Jersey, New York area, Con Ed. Uh, so today was a great day for the stock market. It was not a great day for utility stocks. And people think, well, Duke's safe, right? It's an energy company. Now, of course, the worst case scenario for Duke is that you and I go off the grid and the technology passes them by. But let me just show you what happened year to date. And let me compare it to Con Ed. And you can see here that this has been a massive sell-off when both of these were up, you know, 20, 25% earlier in the year and over the summer. This has been a pretty big sell-off. And why is this happening? Well, when investors expect the Federal Reserve to start raising rates, again, they shouldn't be buying Ruby Tuesday, right? You shouldn't be buying 
many people think like, well, let me buy Duke because I don't know where to get yield right now. If I put my money in the bank, I'm only going to get a 0% rate of return. If I buy Duke, it's relatively safe and I'll get a 4% return. <clears throat> what many individual investors forget is that when you're paying so much for a company, in this case, uh, Duke or, or Con Ed, uh, you can get burned on the stock side when you pay too much for any one stock. And when I was in Columbia, one client said, well, why don't, why don't I just put it in you know, Duke forever and, and I would do just as well without you. And I said, well, let me show you why. You know, and you said, what do you think has done better, utility stock like Con Ed and Duke or the overall market? Now, I know the answer to this question. If we just look at the S&P or the Dow, it's well outperformed, right? Even if you include a dividend, the S&P and the Dow Jones has done so much better than safer utilities. But what I would argue right now is why we're avoiding utilities is they're not safe at all. And I would throw MLPs and real estate investments and real estate investment trusts and uh, even telecom, which we own AT&T and Verizon and Vodafone overseas. They're a little bit cheaper, but there's certainly been a reach for those investments. And if you look at a day like today, Again, people think like, well, AT&T is safe, uh, and AT&T certainly not selling as bad, but AT&T has also come uh, down uh, this year after helping us uh, outperform. So even though we have a dividend strategy, we don't want to pay too much, and clearly right now, uh, utilities are way too expensive. Again, I like to look very long term. This goes back to 1990. I like buying utilities at about 10 to 13, 14 times max earnings in this range right here. And we've owned utilities, and we've done very well with utilities. We've owned Duke, we've owned Con Ed, but I don't want to be owning and buying utilities when they're very expensive up in this range up here. Um, I'll stop again. Any, uh, any other questions while I'm kind of going through some slides? Um, again, I don't want to bore you. I'm writing an hour right now, so I'll go a little bit more. Some more slides I think you may find I'm interested in. This has been a terrific bull market, the second longest in history, and people say, Jim, can this go on longer? Uh, yeah, it could, right? This, so we've had longer, we had the 87 to 2000 bull market, which was huge. We certainly have a long way to go there, and then people say, well, we're due for a recession, we're due for a recession. This has been the uh, third longest, let me see, I had a chart here, economic recovery. Yeah, okay, uh, fourth longest, excuse me. We're about ready to eclipse the 1982 recovery when Reagan, and this is some of my liberal friends on the left that said, oh my God, this is the worst times. I said, ah, oh, they said the same thing about Reagan. We did fine. In fact, Reagan years were, were quite good for uh, the stock market uh, from, 82, from 82 on. And that was a huge expansion. We're about ready to eclipse that. But we certainly could go longer. You don't, you don't know that a recession, you'll have plenty of people who say that they know a recession's coming. They don't. I don't know if a recession's coming for my company. How would I know it's going to come for the overall economy? There's a lot of good news in the market. I think the Federal Reserve is probably going to start raising interest rates. We're starting to see a strengthening labor market. Wages are starting to rise a little bit. Everybody's household balance sheet is improving, right? We're not going out and buying second homes and yachts and things of that nature. We're minding our budgets just like companies are doing. Consumer confidence is improving. People are feeling a little bit better about themselves. Not great. We have very low inflation. Bread and a lot of other commodity prices are down, especially energy prices have been down, you know, decimated over the last year. That allows the Federal Reserve to not have to act right now because, uh, you know, they have a dual mandate. One is to uh, improve uh, job and they certainly we have good jobs right now. And secondly is to control inflation. Paul Volkner in the early 80s knew to stifle inflation, you just raise interest rates. But Janet Yellen's a student, like Bernanke was, of the Great Depression. And in 1937, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates too quickly, which stifled a lot of the shovel-ready projects that Roosevelt had going and uh, put us right into another recession in 1937. So the Fed's got to be careful. A lot of people, including Donald Trump, have clamored for raising interest rates, raising interest rates. In my opinion, that'd be very foolish right now. And why you need a, by the way, why you need a completely independent bank. You know, Alexander Hamilton, many of you know, is my favorite patriot. If you get a chance to come up here in New York and see the play, it's a great play. Andy and I were watching it, and she said, oh, I get it. Now I know why you love 
Hamilton, and, and Hamilton was a big proponent of a, of a bank to help our whole economy. Uh, Andrew Jackson, my most hated president, uh, killed the bank, and we went through calamities for decades after he did that. And of course, we had the, you know, the uh, collapse of 1907, the Federal Reserve Act in, uh, passed in 1913 and brought back the Federal Reserve Bank, which has to stay independent because you don't want a president or Congress to be able to control the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve needs to stifle inflation and also lower rates at times and to be independent uh, of, the, of the federal government. Uh, and again, there's, there can be a lot of good debate amongst economists about what the Fed should be doing, uh, but the Fed needs to remain independent to be able to make those decisions. And uh, whether or not Janet Yellen increases rates here, again, the good thing for you is that we own, we own the bonds. So you're going to get that 7% rate of return regardless of over the next three years, because if you look at our whole bond portfolio right now, I'll just show you where we are. Um, uh, let's see, here we are, distribution. So if you look at our whole portfolio, this is your bonds, my bonds, all of our bonds together. We have basically a, a coupon rate of 7% or so over the next, I'll let it cute here for you. It is always changing. So we have a 7.18% current yield. That means on $100,000, it's going to pay you $7,180 a year. It, the average maturity is over the next three and a half years. So I'm staying short term because, again, if there were the rising rates, I want to stay short term. And even if you see the bond portfolio go down, it doesn't matter. We're going to reset as things are coming due and our portfolio is getting called. You're seeing that right now. Ruby Tuesday may pay us back this year, they may pay us back next year, and they pay me back early, and I go, ah, oh, I hate losing that 8% yield. I'm really happy Ruby Tuesday paid me back, but I hate that we lost that yield early, which is always irritating. Um, so it's a good news, bad news story when we get paid back, and a lot of companies are doing that right now because we're in a low interest rate environment. So as long as I don't make too many mistakes, and we don't have too many defaults, we can make a nice 5 to 7% rate of return from the bond portfolio. And by the way, that may outpay stocks. I can't promise you that your stocks are going to outpace the bond portion of our portfolio. Again, your whole portfolio is pushing out about 5% a year in dividends from the stocks and interest from the bonds. This should remain relatively steady. And why it stays steady, frankly, if you look at any, any company, let's, let's just pull up McDonald's here. Uh, if you pull up McDonald's, you'll notice one thing I continually screen for is very long-term uh, dividend. So you look at the uh, financials of uh, uh, McDonald's, and uh, this is too convoluted. Let me just find the dividends for you so you can see the dividends of, of McDonald's going back over the last uh, few years. It doesn't go back as long as I'd want, but if you look at back over decades, you see that McDonald's pays a nice dividend yield every year. It's been you know relatively steady for our clients and growing every year. The, the yield changes, right, based on the price of the stock. But in 2011, they paid out $2.53 per share. In 2012, they paid $2.87, then they raised it again in 2013, raised in 2014, and then raised it in 2015. God bless you, by the way. Thank you. So at, that, at, at this point, I'll, uh, I'll stop again and, and throw it out to any questions uh, so that you can kind of see that, yeah, there are going to be some sectors of the economy and some sectors that will win more with maybe healthcare, uh, maybe industrials, maybe uh, uh, Trump spends some more. But we're well diversified in a lot of different sectors. We don't want to buy into one particular sector. And our strategy would have been effectively very similar if Hillary uh, was elected. Sometimes I'm able to find a lot of value. I can tell you when Obama was elected, everybody said, oh my God, Obamacare is going to put healthcare companies out of business. We were finding value across the board in healthcare. We didn't own many healthcare companies, but they were so cheap and said such high dividends. The same thing with um, uh, I used to fly Lockheed uh, C-130s, and everybody said, "Oh my God, you know, Obama's coming in. We're going to get out of the Gulf. There's no, no more wars." Well, we know the story, right? We're in plenty of wars. We're fighting. So we bought Northrop and Lockheed and Raytheon, tremendous amount of, of military defense companies that everybody hated paying six plus percent dividends, we're selling at seven, eight times earnings, did tremendously well for our clients. We wound up selling them at 180%, 160%, 140% returns 
because at that point they went up too much, the dividend yield was too little, and the expense of those stocks was too high. So we re redeployed that money. We're always buying the stuff that people hate, right? As value investors, that's always our strategy, and uh, it, it it works out really nicely. Sometimes we don't get paid quickly. Microsoft was one of those companies for years that underperformed and now is up over 100% since we bought it to the point where you know maybe it's getting close to where we're forced to sell it. I don't think so just yet, but uh, that that's always our strategy: slow and steady, get you the dividends. We're not investing in hope that some company goes up, McDonald's goes up, because tomorrow we could be down 20%, but the income will be there for you. That's that's always our strategy. It's the slow and the steady. This is not our first rodeo, as we used to say when I lived down in Texas for a couple of years when I was in flight school. You know, I've been through this before. Over the last couple of decades, I've seen my dad go through even just as bad a time period in 73, 74, the 87 collapse. The dividends and interest is there for our clients to keep you in a comfortable retirement. And if you know, if you're like me, you don't need the dividends and interest right now. We're just reinvesting it back into the portfolio for you. And at that, I will again throw it out to any questions that you may have about what uh, might be on your mind. Hey, hey Jim, with the election, uh, how about what kind of plays do you see in the uh, areas of defense and infrastructure? Yeah, that's a great question. So I was just talking about like um, Lockheed, right? So I, I can uh, obviously know about Lockheed since I flew their airplane. So let's let's just take Lockheed for, or Rockwell Collins for that matter, right? Let's look at Rockwell Collins. So you know the company better than I do. Um, you know, we could look at Rockwell or, or or the other Rockwell Collins or any, or any defense contractor on Northrop. Any of them, they're very similar right now. The problem with some of them is that they got, and if you look at like a, a chart of them too, and I'm not a technician, this is what happened to, I don't want to see a lot, of, we'll, let's just look at the last like 10 years. Let's compare it to Northrop, Grumman, and Raytheon. What's the symbol of your company, Colonel? Of Rockwell, the ROC, what is it? What is it? Rockwell Collins. Where are we? There we go. Um, okay, so if you look at some of these companies, and we've had some huge returns for industrial uh, military companies, especially if we just do like a five year chart, especially compared to, if we compared it to like the SP. Now, we didn't own Collins, fortunately, right? Because that's the green line down here. But we have owned. Get Raytheon in here. Oh, Raytheon's gone. That's right. <laughs> so when you you see these massive returns that we've had at, at this point, if you look at the uh, the price of the companies, we were buying it at half the cost. We were buying it six to seven times earnings. It's not expensive, I'd say. We sold it when it was getting up to 22 times earnings, and the dividend yield was six percent. Now it's down to three. So I think it's fine. Of course. You, you can see the huge returns they had today because everybody said, holy smoke, Trump's president. We're going to be spending a lot more money on defense. And certainly an area I'll be looking at again and, hey, maybe we should be buying uh, you know, buying uh, a defense contract at this time because they may, they may be, we may be uh, picking up some more defense spending. Now, again, I'm not saying let's buy the farm and go all in on defense contractors. I'm talking maybe one or two companies and tilting. Uh, we still want safer companies like the McDonald's and Pepsi's and Kellogg's in our portfolios too. Um, and so that's that's my outlook now is that, yeah, we'll probably pick up on spending. We're going to have to cut spending in certain areas. Where is spending going to be cut? Well, hopefully government in some areas, right? So hopefully we'll have some some government cut somewhere, uh, which, which keeps growing um, because the the Trump administration and Republicans won't be able to spend unlimited. We already have a very high uh, debt, and uh, that's something we definitely need to get get under control. Um, but will will Lockheed be helped by spending? Probably, and that's now with a, a Trump victory. That's an area where I was, you know, the probabilities was that Clinton was going to be elected, and uh, uh, this wasn't the, an area that at 15 times earnings I'm really attracted to Lockheed. But now with Trump, it's 
I'd say more attractive and not overly expensive at that price. Did that, mm -hmm. did that answer your question? Yeah, I was going to say, how about infrastructure and the, uh, uh, you know, with airports and bridges, yeah. roads, yeah. All, all that type of stuff, what what the companies do you see in that sector, if any? Yeah, so we own Caterpillar. That was the the big one today. That's the, that you know, that's the one when you're going down the highway, that's what you see uh, going. And the other big one is uh, Semex, which got hurt really because of the peso, right? So Semex is a Mexican company that makes uh, so you would see companies like this, infrastructure companies, certainly do do better. Um, and uh, that's another area. Whether Hillary was elected or Trump was elected, we were probably going to have to start spending more on infrastructure. And uh, do I want to pay, you know, 200 times earnings for a company? Well, oh, wow, no, that's way, way, way too expensive. Now the forward, the forward PE. Uh, is a little bit more reasonable here because they're doing some takeovers at 16 times already. So sometimes the trailing PE looks a little weird. Um, but these kind of companies also look attractive, and I think we're going to have a massive spending program, kind of like Roosevelt did, right? I mean, I think Trump, nobody really knows what to expect of the guy, right? I mean, Trump, I, I look at Trump as a great experiment. It's kind of like if I had cancer and I know I'm dying, it's like, well, let me take an experimental drug and see if this drug works. Nobody really knows what to expect from Trump on so many different issues. And I think that people in America are fed up of Republicans and, and regular Republicans uh, and spending and saying, you know what, let's give this guy a shot and let's see if it works. And um, so he could, very, he could surprise us in areas that we don't really even expect. My assumption is he'll do the Reagan playbook, though, is that we'll, we'll likely try to you know, do some deficit spending and, 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 and get the economy, cut some taxes, which does help a company like ours, right? I mean, if I can get 5%, 10% of my taxes reduced, that means I can hire one or two more employees. That's good for the economy, right? Our economy is growing then because right now everybody's going like this. They're holding tight. I'm like, well, I'm not going to invest. I'm not going to expand. I'm not going to hire. Even though I had an interview today and I'm looking for new, for new people, I'm reluctant to hire uh, if, um, if I know I'm going to get taxed more. Right. If, if people say, oh, Jim, you're rich, well, yeah, I, I'm very well off, and I'm really thankful that, that you trust us with your, 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 your uh, hard-earned assets and your life savings. Um, but, you know, I don't, most small business people don't consider themselves rich. They're trying to make a budget every day. I have eight employees I've got to pay, and I've got overhead I've got to pay, and, and uh, I'm paying a lot of money in taxes. And if, if that can be cut a little bit to me, that allows me to hire a new a new person, and uh, that's the benefit of, uh, of Trump. How does that how does that help? Well, that helps all businesses, right? That helps not just the shovel ready stuff. That helps every business across the board. That helps accounting firms. That helps because I'll take that money and I'll go out and maybe buy a car finally instead of driving my 2,000 Land Cruiser with 100 or 240,000 miles on it. Maybe I get a new car finally. That helps Ford or GM or wherever I buy the car. Uh, my daughter uh, is driving a 1991 Volvo that she wants a new car, but she's not getting one. Like the tank that she has. Okay, thanks, Jim. Yeah, sure. sure. Any other uh, questions out there? I'm curious what you've been drinking. What's in that cup? <laughs> Just coffee. Just coffee. I know. <laughs> yeah, you know, when when you come from a family of uh, of alcoholics, you, you only have about six glasses of wine a year. That's that's a, that's a that's a limit. And never this goes back to flight school where I never drank during the week. That was like a it's a it's a occupational hazard to uh, to, to to drink during the week. Too many too many marine you know, uh, drink too much. Yeah. I hope you know I was kidding. Oh no, yeah, of course. <laughs> I am working on three hours of sleep right now, though, so I need I need the coffee. Are you in, you're in New York? Yes. I am actually New Jersey, on the on the other side of the Hudson River. Hope you're well, well down there in uh, Florida. All right, yeah. Any other um, any other questions? No, I I oh. tagged on late. Um, quite frankly, uh, I can pick up the first part of it on your website. Is that correct? Yeah, if, if you want to watch it again, you can just um, 
give me a day or two and we'll have our team uh, all you do is go to the um, go to our website and click on our YouTube page in the upper right corner here and uh, you can just click on you can see the past presentations I've had uh, that, that are posted and we'll we'll post this right up here for you and you can you can watch the first part I was looking at your image on screen Jim where was it in the upper right corner please uh, right. the YouTube page on our on our home page there's a, a LinkedIn button and then there's a YouTube oh, right there. page okay gotcha gotcha yeah. or you you could just google Altrius YouTube and you'll you'll get to us too hey Jim yes, sir yeah it's Larry Newell how you doing good, good. thanks for joining uh, this, us. This, this may not be the time for it but earlier when you went over the 20 percent on the bonds I, I haven't really dealt that much with these uh, the kind of bonds you do. I, I was a little confused on how you got to 20%. Is that something that you could touch on just a minute? I get the yield, but I don't get how it gets up to 20% when it drops to 95. Yeah, so basically think of it this way. If you're, if you're at, um, so our bonds are up 20% this year, but remember they were down 14% over about an 18 month period. So if, if you buy something for a hundred dollars, let's say a hundred dollars, right? And it goes down in value for let's call it let's say it goes down fifteen percent, it's gonna go down to eighty five dollars, right? So if it goes back up to a hundred, assuming Ruby Tuesday doesn't go bankrupt, well you've made you've made uh you've made fifteen dollars on eighty five, so you've made a seventeen about eighteen percent six percent return plus during the year it paid you a coupon of say seven percent so your total return the price appreciation of the bond and when the bonds called they're going to give you your money back if it when it matures in 2021 or 2018 plus they paid you interest of that so your total return for this year would be 24.6 percent and this year our bonds are up over over 20 percent because we've had okay I see, I see what you plus price appreciation I got you bonds are very confusing uh, and most people understand stocks and bonds are a little bit you know you're talking about discounts and premiums and they're very opaque and pricing what we're doing is because we're a fiduciary we have to get our clients the best price so we're calling JP Morgan we're calling Merrill Lynch we're calling Credit Suisse we're calling all the 800 bond dealers that we have access to and we see their prices and we say okay to the TD Ameritrade trader okay we've negotiated the best price that we see out there uh, it's at JP Morgan uh, buy four hundred thousand dollars of Ruby Tuesday and then our traders are piecing that out to everybody's portfolio and and spreading it out and again spreading out the risk and, and I, I'm getting the same price that you're getting uh, if you buy a bond from a, a, a broker he's selling you a yield he may be selling you a seven percent yield or putting in a municipal bond and putting it out 30 years and burying his commission inside of it we don't do that we're, we're you're getting the price that we're that we're paying for it our fee is always the same you know and we're getting the same return that you're getting so you always know we're getting the best price for you amongst all the dealers that are uh, that are out there I understand it was the fact that it's up that much this year was what you were saying <clears throat> Exactly. Great. Thank you. Sure. Over longer periods of time with a bond portfolio, you know, again, if you look at just our bond portfolio, of course, most all of our clients are looking at if you our global income, which is this strategy right here, is comprised of the international stocks that I was talking about. There's a, we own forty international stocks. The US stocks, which right now we own thirty. And then our bonds, which is you know 80 to 90 bonds that we own for our clients. And as a percentage, well, right now it's about 45% in bonds and a little bit in cash. It's about 20% international, and then the remainder, 33 or 34% or so, is in, in U.S. stocks, small caps and mid caps and large cap companies. And but if a lot of advisors around the country that we're selling our mutual fund to, which is this mutual fund here, or another firm, or even a private client may only want to buy our bonds, 
they can go to the unconstrained fixed income strategy, they can look at our fact sheet and they can say, oh, all right, over the last 10 years, they've made a 5.7% uh, rate of return. And that's that's exactly what we're trying to do generally is get between, you know, four and a half to six and a half percent rates of return for bonds because we're in such a low interest rate environment right now where treasury, a 10-year treasury is yielding 2%. We're trying to beat them. We're trying to beat that two percent by another two to three percent uh, by taking a little bit more risk. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other uh, questions out there? We had a packed house tonight, and so I appreciate everybody uh, tuning in, and and I'll we'll get this up on the website soon. I always forget how to get it on the YouTube page, but we got a marketing company that'll that'll do it for us, and hopefully I recorded it properly. Uh, Jim, your funds are not available through other brokerage houses, are they? It's just directly from you? They are. No, no, they're available through any advisor. They're on TD Ameritrade, and uh, in another week they'll be available. I think another week or two they're going to be available on Fidelity. That's uh, what I Fidelity's platform. Was. Fidelity, that's... Uh, on Fidelity, but in another week or two. Yeah, I think there's a Chicago company that has a firm in New York that has about 200 million that is going to be using our mutual fund, and they clear primarily through Fidelity, so that they requested that our mutual fund be on the platform. For our private clients, I always tell them, do not buy the mutual fund. And the mutual fund has done well this year; it's up, but. When we can buy the individual bonds for our clients, you're so much better off because you control the interest rate risk. When rates start to rise, remember, if it was if I'm pooling all of our clients' assets together and some advisor in New York calls, I've got to liquidate Ruby Tuesday, which in turn hurts everybody in the mutual fund. So the mutual fund is one way you can invest through us, through an advisor, but uh, for our private clients, we are, and, and unfortunately for smaller, like we'll get a referral with like, Jim, can you help my son? He only has fifty or $60,000, then we have to use mutual funds and ETFs. But for our normal clients, when we have a million plus in assets, we're, we're um, buying individual stocks and bonds for them and directing the income. It's just a much better way to invest. Thank you. That's good. Any other uh, any other questions out there? All right. Well, um, thanks again for uh, joining this evening. And if you have any other questions, just shoot me a uh, just shoot me a, 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 an email. You can get to any of our emails by going to the website. Just go to the team page here and click on my goofy face and uh, you'll see my email right here. You can just click on it and shoot me an email, and you can do that for any of our, uh, any of our associates. So that's a, that's a bearded me. I'm not, I'm not bearded right now. So clean shaven today. Jim, get some sleep. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And hang in there. I'm sure we'll have plenty of volatility ahead here for the end of the year. And, uh, but I'm still very bullish on uh, on capitalism in general, and I know that we'll have great companies that keep paying us dividends. So hang in there, just keep collecting the income, and don't worry about the day-to-day -day, uh, volatility of the market. Let, 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 let me get the ulcers over it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, All right, Jim. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. See you, Jim.